You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 389. And in this one, I chat with Lauren Rosen. Lauren is a licensed marriage and family therapist and founder of the Centre for the Obsessive Mind. We discuss her OCD story, what is mindfulness, some benefits of mindfulness, learning to let go of the question, making space for and accepting the presence of feelings, techniques and practices of mindfulness, and much more. Really enjoyed this chat with Lauren, definitely got philosophical in places which I always enjoy. Hope you find this episode useful. And thank you to our podcast partners, NoCD. And NoCD is celebrating three years of partnering with this podcast. And in honor of this anniversary, NoCD have offered people in the UK a special deal because I am a UK citizen. So to honor the three-year partnership, they are offering new members in the UK a reduced rate of $32 US dollars, roughly about £25 sterling per 60-minute session if you start therapy before the 31st of July. You'll be able to continue treatment at this discounted rate for two months. To access this reduced rate, schedule a free call with their team and mention the code OCD Stories. That's code OCD Stories to get this discount. And you can find out more by going to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD Stories. So thank you to NoCD for offering some of my listeners this great discount. And of course, if you're in the UK currently, NoCD don't take private health care. So hopefully this discount helps you access therapy. And of course, if you're in the States, no CD, take a lot of healthcare plans. So go to their website to find out if you're covered. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. This podcast episode is available as a video recording on our Patreon. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. So thank you to Lauren for her time and expertise. And of course, thank you to you guys for listening. As always, it means a lot. And without further ado, here she is. Welcome to the podcast, Lauren. Thank you, Stu. It's really lovely to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on. And we met in person in April 2022. That sounds right. Yeah. Changes. Yeah. Um, Cool. So it's been been a while, but we we got there and it's great to have you on. And um, before we talk about today's topic, which will be mindfulness and OCD, um, you know, be good to, as you know, from therapists, I always ask them, like, what, why treat OCD? Why become a therapist? Also, if you have a mental health story, if you want to share any of that, you you can too. Yeah, well, I am happy to to dive in. And yeah, the reality is that I come to this work uh, because of my own, well, at least in part informed by my own mental health journey and my own journey with OCD in particular. Um, I had been interested since I was a kid in psycho psychotherapy and, and psychology. Um, <clears throat> and I think that that's probably because I was in therapy from a young age. Um, and But at the same token, um, I'm just endlessly fascinated by the human mind. It's a pretty wild organ, you know, the brain. Um, but yeah, in terms of my, I'm, I'm pretty open about, about my journey with OCD. And I think I was about seven years old when it all started, but, uh, that, that statistic of 14 to 17 years always really stands out to me because it wasn't until I was 24 years old that I was properly diagnosed and, and I got, exposure and response prevention and, and mindfulness-based therapy to support me in it. Um, but I, it was right around the time that I learned about death. My aunt was, uh, dying of, of cancer and, um, and my mom had just returned to work. So lots of, and I think this is not uncommon of, of people's stories generally is that, Hmm. There, like, there's often it's in moments of of shift of change uh, that that symptoms start to flare up, and so lots of moving parts in my life. This big idea of of death was obviously pretty daunting to me, um, as it is, I think, to most, to greater some greater or lesser extent. Um, but I was a sensitive kid already, and so 
um, I started getting really worried about these like pretty in like in retrospect, wild existential fears for a seven year old. Um, so uh, the the sort of in the thick of it, it was a lot of questions mainly to my mom at the time, like it was, you know, lots and lots of reassurance seeking, which at that time, nobody was talking about the fact that that was a symptom of, of OCD. And it was, um, what if I die? What if you die? But mainly it was when I die, will, you know, will I go to heaven? Um, will I like it? What if I don't like it? Eternity is a really long time. And what if I'm stuck there? Mm -hmm. And, um, so there was, all, and so all of these questions and my, my, my mother is, um, she's one of my favorite humans, um, honestly. And she had so much patience for me as a kid. And I think she was just so, um, bereft that there wasn't, she didn't know what to do. And, um, so constantly just trying to answer my questions and being like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Which of course, and we know is not, is not particularly helpful. Now she knows too. Um, so I went to, from therapist to therapist to therapist. And I finally uh, um, went to one who, while, while she didn't give me a diagnosis of OCD, she helped me to accept uncertainty, which of course, this is all with the, the lenses of hindsight. But she said, to me as a kid, well, where were you 10 years ago? And I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like I'm seven. I have no idea where I was 10 years ago. She's like, but you were okay then. I was like, I guess, you know, she's like, well, where will you be 10 years after you die? And I was like, I don't know. But Very she Alan said, Watts. yeah, <laughs> just like that. Yeah. 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 That's so funny. I didn't, I didn't know that. I'll have to, I'll have to look at, you know, cause he's a, he's a trip, but um, yeah. And it, it did that supported me and dropping yeah. that and saying, I don't know. And I'm just going to not know. Um, but unfortunately there was no, right. Like, it wasn't like we were talking about the con, like, not that you necessarily would be with a seven-year-old, but to some extent, like talking about this big concept of uncertainty and how it can show up and, all of these different areas and, and generally does. And so, you know, uh, like many people in that sort of 14 to 17 year gap between onset of symptoms and correct diagnoses, uh, yeah, there was just a lot of different iterations and manifestations of anxiety. And um, so I wouldn't necessarily classify all of it in that you know, realm of OCD, although I personally on the clinical side tend to be, of, uh, you know, like David Barlow talks a lot about um, like this sort of unifying uh, idea of an underlying uh, syndrome, right? And I, I do, I, I see that in my work with anxiety disorders, I imagine, like, I'd actually be really curious to know what your thoughts are on this, but I, um, you know, the mechanism is, seems to me to be really the same, whether it's yeah. social anxiety or health anxiety or generalized anxiety that it's, I don't know. Yeah. It's all really similar. Yeah. 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 Not that obviously there are nuances there, but yeah, of course. But yeah. But not understanding that that like cycle of having thoughts come into your head and having feelings about those thoughts and then trying to sort of resolve the doubt that's bubbled up because the thoughts came up, you know, um, that, that, that cycle is something that I chased for a long time in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, and you could probably even extend it to my, my journey in terms of my, like, I have a history of eating disorders. And so, like I said, it just sort of, um, and granted they're different, but there's so much similarity, like, how will people people perceive my body? What if my body's not good enough? And all of these questions that you're constantly trying to answer and to make sure like the, like the fear isn't true. Um, and then basically uprooting your life, trying to make sure that, that, um, that everything's okay. And that, that, you know, your, whatever the feared outcome is, isn't going to come to pass. So, you know, like I said, hop, popped up in lots of different ways, generalized anxiety and um, my anxiety about my body and 
Um, social anxiety, although it's funny, I wouldn't have put myself in the social anxiety category until, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago. So like well into being a therapist, but that, um, because I'm not a shy person per se, like, um, it doesn't manifest in, in what people typically think, but lots of, you know, the noise, the constant, like, what are they thinking about me? Am I good enough? Mm. That, are they going to judge me? Did I say I should review what I just said? And, you know, I was uh, to sort of paint a picture too. I, as you know, and I don't know if, you know, people generally know, but um, I lived in England when I was four to when I was six, because my father is British. And when I came back to the States, they skipped me ahead a grade because you start school a year earlier in the UK. Um. And when I did, I was always a year younger than everyone else. So I was not a popular kid. I was like kind of odd. And then I was really sensitive. And then I've got these strange questions about, you know, <laughs> what if I don't like heaven? And, you know, like this didn't uh, set me up for for being really in the in crowd. So, um, yeah, so like all of that popping up and then managed to find alcohol. That was another part of my journey, you know, and and a way to sort of quiet all of the noise, you know, all of the noise about what do people think about me and what if all of these scary things happen um, and what if I'm not okay. Um, but I was very fortunate. I was 19 when I got sober and um, and I, yeah, I haven't had a drink in, gosh, it's almost 20, uh, I'm aging myself, but yeah, it's 18 years now, which is insane. Um but I, I shared that part mainly because the thing that brought me into this field really properly, as I said, I'd been interested in it since I was a little kid, but um, the thing that finally shifted like, okay, this is really what I want to do um, was going into to treatment myself and having such a profound experience of, oh my gosh, like this is these tools, this, this work is life-changing. And I wanted to be able to give that to other people. And the route by which I got there <laughs> was that I started having obsessions about whether or not I had relapsed on a piece of tiramisu. Mm -hmm. uh, I was several years. And again, it's that, that element of things are in, in shift and flux my, my sponsor of several years. And, you know, I'm 19 when I get sober, like all these people are kind of like older family figures to me. Like there's definitely like a parental role and she ended up leaving town and um, we really didn't have much contact. She didn't have much contact with anyone after she left. And so lots of flux. And um, I had, I, at the time, like when I'd eaten the piece of tiramisu, I freaked out. I called her. She's like, no, of course you didn't relapse on a piece of tiramisu. Don't be ridiculous. And so I was like, okay. But when I couldn't reach her, right? Like when I couldn't have that reassurance from that person, it was like the bottom fell out. And so I spent two years ultimately trying to figure out whether or not I'd relapsed on that piece of tiramisu. And it was hell. Um, it sounds... It, it sounds absurd on its face. And I think that that's probably one of the more frustrating things about having mm. OCD is like, and even let, you know, you can say as a kid, like, what, like, why would you be trying to figure that out? That's, it's, it's, there's nothing to be figured out, but, um, but it was torture, right? Because I was spending every single day, um, just like when I was a kid and I was, terrified and I asked my mother repeatedly these questions, I would go around to pretty much anyone who would listen and tell them what had happened and try to get their feedback and try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, these brief moments of respite of like, ah, it's okay. Yeah. I'm just going to keep my sobriety date. It's fine. And then it would kick back up again. And in addition to that, during that time, I was constantly in my head doing the mental calculus of like, oh, well, am I, you know, did I relapse? Did I relapse? Am I, and it was all down to what we would call moral scrupulosity. Like I, there's a, an idea in 12 step that in order to recover, you have to be rigorously honest. And I really like, I, I stuck to that. And I, you know, I, 
I agree with that. I mean, I think it's wonderful to be rigorously honest, but when you have OCD, you tend to think, yeah. take things to an extreme, <laughs> as you know. So um, anyway, all of that to say that that on the heels of that journey, finding a therapist who understood, um, and it wasn't, it's not like it was a straight shot. I, I did the whole dance of well, what if I don't really have OCD and what if I'm just in denial and what if I'm saying all of this so that, you know, like, which I, I, I would say is more the rule than the exception with people is that this, this disorder it like folds in on itself. It's spinny. It's like the movie inception, right? It's very like, uh, um, but once I kind of got on board with the fact that it really wasn't about the uncertainty of whether or not I relapsed, but rather about just making a choice and moving forward and not knowing mm -hmm. that life changed. And I, I, um, that's why I decided to come in Like You know, that's when I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. This is how I, I want to support people. Um, yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thank you for being so open and, and honest there. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, with the whole, uh, when you're a very young kid, like worrying about, well, if there is a heaven, that's eternity and eternity is a very long time. And I had that, you know, I'm five, six years old, I had that say, I'd have dreams about it or I'd wake mm. just before going to sleep, I'd be laying there in the dark. And actually I say I had dreams. I'm still to this day, unsure whether it was, I was dreaming this or it was just before I went to sleep, but it was at nighttime anyway. Mm. And this, this idea of going through my head about heaven and then the afterlife and eternity and then that becoming torture because it goes on forever you know all of it was horrible yeah. so to, yeah to hear you say that I'm sure oh that's really yeah wrestle with that you know the ones with yeah. OCD maybe yeah it's interesting though I don't know that I've ever heard anyone have that particular fear about eternity and being essentially torturous so you know it's mm. actually nice to to find a kindred spirit on that one um yeah. not that i would wish that on anyone you yeah. least of all but um yeah it it's like the bottom falling out mm. right and there's no and that i i think that that's that experience of doubt and uncertainty and anxiety is is mm -hmm that sensation of falling right? there's no tether there's no when there's no answer and all you want is desperately to be able to cling tight to something and to say like yeah. oh no it's going to be okay yeah yeah well there you said about falling at that sort of young age i did have reoccurring dreams of just falling and mm. nothing catching me i remember yeah. waking up terrified so yeah it probably all links back to like uncertainty and you know yeah um, yeah yeah i want to yeah i want to caveat if anyone believes in heaven i'm but the way i look at it now is if there is a heaven we wouldn't be as we are in it if that makes sense we probably wouldn't have mm. a concept of time and therefore eternity would not feel horribly torturous mm. it would actually be blissful because mm. anyway just to, yeah yeah not yeah oh, i like that, that interesting cool. philosophical bent yeah but that just came to me but that was my five-year-old view of assuming we would be exactly as we are now in the afterlife which i doubt if there is such thing as the afterlife we would be exactly as we are at least right. in our human sense and our ability for time and all of that cognitive cognitive stuff yeah 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 well that sounds there, there's something alan watts in that for sure i don't know what it is but... maybe i've listened to a lot of him so i'm sure he's flowing through me somehow yeah um, that sounds right yeah so um mindfulness firstly what is it that is a great question i tend to use um at least part of john cabot zinn's definition um so and for those who don't know john cabot zinn is the the guy who basically brought mindfulness to the west and made it popular and manualized it there's a, a big thing called uh mindfulness based stress reduction um which is actually a really like a solid program um but he kind of secularized it in again in the west and so he defines it as present moment awareness on purpose without judgment and i i tend to and the on purpose part is important but i don't i i tend to just say present moment awareness without judgment <laughs> mm -hmm. um for the sake of simplicity but 
the way that I have learned about mindfulness and that I teach mindfulness is really that uh, these three components of the three components, I, I tend to think the non-judgment piece slips through the cracks most often because mindfulness in terms of how we use it in our daily lives is often used as a synonym for just awareness. Like keep, be mindful about that. Um, and so that awareness piece is there. People often uh, associate it with meditation and Buddhism and, and all of that. So, and the sort of like be here now present moment stuff, but that element of being non-judgmental of your experience is I think what really sets mindfulness apart from other kinds of awareness. Um, and, you know, I, I think my, over time, like I, I started with sort of mindfulness based CBT in terms of how I work and, um, obviously with that emphasis on exposure and response prevention. And then over the years, I think I've progressively become more and more enamored of acceptance and commitment therapy, which of course is very mindfulness based yeah. um, and sort of seeing your it, ERP through the lens of act hmm. or acceptance and commitment therapy or through mindfulness that um, so let me back up. I think the problem with judgment, right? Like the problem with our tendency as humans to judge everything, which is very evolutionarily beneficial, understandably, like we want to jump to conclusions. Um, I think it's Daniel Kahneman who says, you know, the brain is a machine for jumping to conclusions, right? And it, it's, it makes sense. The, these shortcuts that we have in our minds are um, have kept us alive. You know, we're the, we're the descendants of the people that jumped to conclusions when there was a lion in front of them, <laughs> you know, like, or when they heard a twig snap and in, in on the Savannah and they ran the opposite way and it did end up being a lion. So understandably there's some benefit, but this, this tendency to, to put everything into these categories while efficient, right. And, and Im important when it counts, um, can be very limiting. And what we, you know, from that acceptance and commitment therapy standpoint, the, the idea that it's not the, the experience that we're having, which we might be judging like a, like a thought or a feeling that's the problem. It's the resistance of that experience. It's the trying to fix that experience. That's the problem. So we want to practice acceptance. So if we go back to mindfulness as a concept and this idea of non-judgment, Understanding that as soon as we judge something to be good or bad, without that that sort of uh, objective awareness, uh, we're we're sort of predisposing ourselves to resistance, right? Like it's like it's really quick leap between I don't like this and I don't want this. Yeah. So. I realize I get very heady about this stuff and esoteric. So please feel free to rein me in <laughs> um, and, and try to keep it, you know, if, if uh, I get too far out there, but I think understanding that. And if, if we have this ability to see our experiences, particularly the ones we can't change, like thoughts, feelings, urges, sensations, the things that just pop in, that we can, if we know we can either resist or accept them and resistance is futile. It does nothing, right? We, it's not like, oh, I'm going to resist the fact that I have these thoughts and then they're going to go away. Anyone with OCD who's tried that knows that it's not very effective. It's just going to have us gnashing our teeth and be, and, and cause suffering in addition to, to the pain. Um, and so learning how to be in acceptance of these things is crucial in the first step on the road to that acceptance is having that ability to see things like, Oh, Oh, okay. I'm having a thought right now, as opposed to I'm having this thought right now. I really don't want to be having this thought right now, make it go away. I'm going to do all of the things I can to make it go away. And then mm -hmm. off we are trying to, trying to fix a problem. That's not a problem and that can't be solved. No, of course. Good point. And it just feeds into the ACD cycle. And then we're, we're, building it and building it to it's a massive problem mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. yeah yeah i like that you mentioned act i also find act is like even if people have resistance to mindfulness like even mm. though it's been secularized to a point 
some people are still going to have issue with that and that's okay and i think act is an even more scientific framework in which mindfulness gets trojan horsed in um, <laughs> yes they, so that's why i like act and that whole like like notice and naming oh right now i'm having a worry or right now i'm having a thought just naming it you know being yeah. mindful of that just stops us as you say hooking in and i don't like this i don't want this because as soon as we're in that place we're compulsing yep totally right. it's a hop skip and a jump yeah. um that's why i like i have the victor frankel quote up in my office between stimulus and response yeah. there is a space but in that space is right. our power right. to chew our choose our response and mm-hmm. and our response lies our growth and our freedom and i think that that's that's sort of what we're outlining here is um that if we're able to pause and see the stimulus, mm. uh, then then we have right, the thought, the feeling, whatever, um, that we cultivate the freedom to choose a different response and whether or not we're going to lose our lives to trying to resolve anxiety, uncertainty, these things that, that can't be resolved. Um, so yeah, so that's where, I mean, I think mindfulness is so helpful in so many respects within the framework of OCD recovery. Um, but I think you're right. I think the beauty of ACT is that it is a total Trojan horse and it's it like, like let's make this very, um, a, like a little bit more of a stepwise approach which is fabulous. Um, Whereas mindfulness can get a a little bit more untethered as a concept. In fact, uh, I I brought over my book this morning because, you know, this is my, one of my favorite mindfulness books ever. It's living beautifully with uncertainty and change by Pema Chodron. And anyone who's watching on Patreon can see that I've read this book within an inch of its life uh, several times. Um, But it, you know, it gets, it gets a little bit, um nebulous and messy and uncomfortable and i do i do think that there's a like it's that's hugely helpful for those of us who like things to be so concrete and tangible and cognitive is like okay i'm going to like learn how to just not have an answer or i'm just going to be be with feelings but it's all very experiential versus conceptual right yeah. um and So like, and that's okay. So another thing that I think mindfulness offers for those of us with OCD is a a framework through which to practice disengaging from mental compulsions. Mm -hmm. And I think specifically mindfulness meditation is so beneficial in that. But to your point earlier, I think a lot of people hear meditation and they're like, ah, oh, the N word and they run the other direction. And I know for me, for a long time, I was like, it, 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 it has a sense of being so inaccessible and, um, yeah, kind of intimidating. Like I have to do things this certain way and I have to know all the ins and outs. And mm-hmm. at the end, I'm going to be levitating and, you know, I don't know, something fun. Yeah. I wish, I wish there was more levitation really in meditation. It would make it that fun. Would be nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but learning how to just simply anchor your attention in some sort of present moment experience mm-hmm. and, and notice when your mind wanders, cause that's what minds do. And then to bring it back over and over and over again. This is the practice of mindfulness meditation. And it's the practice of living with intrusive thoughts and anxious feelings. It's being able to continually notice when you're off on some side mission and like, you know, to make it more concrete to like figure out whether or not you've relapsed on a piece of tiramisu or, you know, what's going to happen after you die. (laughs) You know, like all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, I'm doing that thing again. I've decided I don't want to do that thing again. So I'm just going to like not know and bring my attention back to what's actually happening. And you can do that anywhere, right? You can be grocery shopping or supermarkets, we'd call it, or, you know, picking your kid up from school or playing sport and your mind's going to wander, not just OCD, it might wander on paying a bill or Mm -hmm. a homework assignment. And it's all, yeah, catching it and bringing it back to the moment. Yeah. Um, I think, 
so the hard thing is i think when you're really in ocd and really amped up in it it is really hard to let go of the question right let go of the ocd and pull back so it's i realize as i say this it's easier said than done at first you can train yourself which is i don't know if anything you want to say on that or in that moment of it being really hard to to pull your back pull yourself back yeah no i think it's a really good point and at first I mean, especially when, when you're in it, when you're in the throes of it, it's like, Mm. if I drop this question, what happens to me, you know, and that's, Mm. that's the scary bit and saying like, you know, for me, if I, if I take my own experiences and like, as a case example, it's like, um, if I accepted that, like, I, I could be lying, then I, may live in an authentic life. And then that would be in in my mind, like the worst thing that I could do. And so this idea of dropping that search and just like letting it be was terrifying. And I think actually this is where breaking apart, like sounds so mechanical, but like, Oh, this is a thought and this is a feeling and this is a behavior becomes so important because in that moment. Now, granted in the moment at first, it's going to be really hard to see all of those things, which is why I love exercises like mindfulness meditation so much, because it's practicing this awareness of when your mind wanders and what's happening in there and coming back all in a vacuum. So there's very little competing for your attention. Um, it's easy to get bored in that space. So you're going to wander a whole lot, right? <laughs> like yeah. if you're anchoring on something like, oh, I'm going to just watch the breath. Then, you know, five seconds later, you're like, oh, I'm off to what am I having for lunch? Um, so yeah, I think that understanding, okay, this is a thought. So any sort of words or narrative or story um, that's that's popping into my mind. And then there's the feelings um, which, uh, you know, I, from my research and sort of how my lens at this point, um, I, I really do think of feelings as just uh, emotions, particularly as just a conglomeration of physical sensations that we call like anxiety, anxieties to varying degrees, you know, like, a, a racing heart beat and a tightness in your chest or a lifting in your stomach or a tension in your jaw, your shoulders, the, you know, stomach butterflies movement, right? Like there are all of these, these physical sensations that we associate with anxiety, but understanding the difference between the two is really important because if you're in the thick of it and you really want to engage with the, the content of like, well, did I relapse? What, what if I don't, um, what if I don't like the afterlife? Um, that like, if you can see, okay, this is a thought I'm having a thought. It has created this emotional experience in me. The emotional experience is very intense and I'm feeling all of these physical sensations that leaves me with, can I breathe in and make space for the physical sensations, which I think is a really helpful tool is like, okay, this is what we're left with. We make the decision to say, I don't know. I'm left with all of these physical sensations. And if I can, as from an act model, right? Like if I can breathe in and make space for those physical sensations, I get to get back to living my life on my terms. Mm. Um, I will make a brief nod to, to cognitive work. I think it gets a really bad rap sometimes within the, the OCD community. Um, it was part of the work that I initially did when I was in, when I was being treated and it still factors into the work that I do with clients. It's just, I'm actually doing a presentation on um, navigating OCD with a co-occurring uh, anxiety disorder at, at the upcoming IOCDF conference. And it's like cognitive work plays a role in most anxiety disorders. It's just also understanding that we don't want that to go on forever because it can just turn into like this constant mental debate that takes you away from your life. And that, that feeds oftentimes will actually re-trigger the anxiety and make it worse. So um, all of that to say that when I, when I say cognitive work to the lay person, right, what we're looking at is, okay, well, what's rational and reasonable here. And, you know, I mentioned, um, 
uh, Daniel Kahneman earlier and all of the biases and the, and then we'll talk about like things like cognitive distortions, which are essentially just lenses through which we all view the world. And so understanding that like, oh, I'm, this is a pretty all or none thing. Um, and do I, you know, is there anything that, that does this seem rational? Does this seem reasonable? Um, and letting that inform the choice that you make. Not that it's going to take away your anxiety, right? Mm. If, and if that's the aim, then you're going to get caught in that back and forth and, and you're lost in mental compulsions, essentially. But how do I want to behave is sometimes a difficult thing to suss out when you're in the thick of it and when when you're dealing with something that's brand new in terms of of an obsession. So just saying like briefly, <laughs> how do I want to approach this? what's helpful or unhelpful from an acceptance and commitment therapy standpoint. Um, I think that that's also an important part of it because it's a bridge to taking that leap to accepting uncertainty. Um, and it doesn't, I don't know if you see this, but I, I, a lot of the time it's like, I, when I see clients, they're like, oh, well, I should accept all uncertainty and I should never do things to get rid of my anxiety. I'm like, that's, that's actually not true. Like it's fine to, avoid things that cause you anxiety if it's not causing any issue in your life. Like if you have a extreme fear of heights, you don't have to go jump out of a plane, you know? Um, nobody's <laughs> forcing you to do that. It's just like the, the element of functional impairment, you know? And, and so like, where was I going with that? The, the tendency to be like, I, well, I, I should just completely and utterly in all circumstances, accept my thoughts, my feelings, um, and uncertainty. It's like, well, no, I mean, there are circumstances where it makes sense to, to consider things a little bit, or, you know, to be, it's just trying to keep it from getting so excessive that it overtakes you. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. I mean, anxiety is a good thing. Um, right. <laughs> I often say this to my clients, like if, if you didn't have the amygdala, you would probably cross the road without looking. And if you did that throughout your life, at some point, your luck's going to run out. You yeah. know, um, if you were, if you're unlucky enough, lucky enough because they're amazing creatures, but unlucky enough because they're dangerous to walk through a jungle somewhere and there's a massive tiger in front of you and you don't have an amygdala, you're going to just appreciate its beauty and you're probably going to stroke it. And yeah, that thing is going to rip your face off. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's going to maul you. <laughs> yeah, to quote yeah. Anchorman. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but so the amygdala is a useful thing. It, you know, Very. if you if you come across someone that is just giving off certain vibes that might be dangerous, your amygdala is going to trigger. Obviously, that can get a bit grey because sometimes it might fire with people that are completely safe, and that's where anxiety disorders come in. But well, you, yeah. You know, so it's, yeah, it's, but that's it's where it's thing. like, yeah, and that's where you kind of have to weigh. Okay, well, is there any evidence backing that up? You don't want to just yeah. make the choice based on what the the amygdala is. A, it's a, an alarm system, but mm -hmm. you know, if you you know called the fire department every time your fire alarm went off, that would be kind of a mess. So you kind of look around and you go like, okay, well the the toast got burnt and, you know, it yeah. seems like that's probably the reason the fire alarm went off. I don't know with 100% certainty, I suppose that a fire won't start, but I'm just going to go with that. Um, no, totally. Actually, I'm curious if you ever listened, there's a podcast, at least here in the States called Invisibilia. Uh, it's on NPR. National Rings Public a Radio. bell, but I don't think I've heard it. So there's an episode that's about a woman who has a disorder and it, the, the, uh, one of the, the effects of the disorder is that her amygdala is completely cal calcified. And so she doesn't have fear and it's fascinating. Like she can't even reveal her name on air because people will like there, she has no filter for like, Oh, people are taking advantage of me. Right. Like, and that's actually, I don't know. I feel passionately about this idea that coming to appreciate our minds as they are, you know, those of us who deal with OCD and anxiety, like it's an incredible thing, but you have to know how to effectively drive the car. Right? <laughs> and right, if, yeah. 
you know? They, yeah, may, maybe people with OCD were given a Ferrari for a brain, you know? And if you're not an experienced driver and you drive a Ferrari, you're going to be spinning all over the place because you don't mm -hmm. know how to control its power. You know, that's maybe one way to look at it. Um, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, the brain's just working too good. It's, it's too anxious too often. Yeah. Um, anxiety in and of itself is a good thing, but taken to the extreme, it's a nightmare. It is. Um, if, yeah. if you let that be the only thing that's dictating all of your choices, exactly. it, it, yeah. it's a mess. I often think of, you know, people are like, oh, well, I'm going to trust my gut, which is one of my favorite expressions ever. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a bad idea. Um, <laughs> but like, I just think that this idea of like basing any choice on purely on emotion, it's like we have so many uh, examples of how that's not a good plan. And one of my favorites is Romeo and Juliet. Like they were, they were all in, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I love this person. And, you know, like three days later, they're dead. So, you know, I'm just saying it's like, yeah. let, and not to say that, like, I'm not trying to aggravate people's anxiety here, but you know, if, if you find yourself like, oh, well, I should avoid this because I'm anxious. It's like, well, not necessarily like maybe, but also maybe not. And, and letting the facts of a situation inform your choice is probably wise. Yeah. 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 I think that the gut thing is so complicated, isn't it? Cause mm -hmm. um, like there's been times in my life where I've had what I'd call a gut instinct. And for me, I knew at the time what it was. It was an OCD because there was no doubt there. I wasn't mm -hmm. anxious in the slightest it was i remember one time i met someone that someone else had told me about and they were like oh this person's great da, 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 da. and i met mm. them and i just got this sudden intense feeling of this person there's not something wrong with this person like mm. and i wasn't anxious i continued to be friendly with them to you know to give them benefit of the doubt and and later on it turns out they weren't like dangerously criminal or anything but they they weren't great to be honest they had a lot of stuff they needed to work through to be the <laughs> compassionate way of saying it but my gut was right and then the person yeah. that said they were they were great were late okay yeah they weren't so great um, <laughs> but so there are those moments but I think often when people say it's my gut in OCD it's well are you anxious is there a lot I'm not saying you can't have a gut feeling and be anxious because the gut feeling is telling you something scary but again see even now I'm getting tongue-tied and it just shows you how complex it is and I don't have an answer yeah but I think yeah yeah I no I, I think that's such a good point and I actually like I I do think that a gut feeling has a, a place in in the very same way that anxiety has a place in decision making mm. it's just one thing isn't it but it's one factor yeah, yeah. and and letting any one factor determine how you view a, a situation which is all situations are far more complex, I think, than we'd like to believe. Um, yeah, no, but I totally get it. And, you know, that's actually the story of how Stu and I met. He, uh, yeah, after the you. fact, was like, oh, man, I yeah, had this, yeah, that's just really <laughs> this you horrible. I was talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, this, see, no, I obviously yeah. I am. Well, hopefully, obviously I am, too. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's it is yeah. such a tricky thing. It's such yeah. a tricky thing. Um But again, it's like trying to figure that out, gut instinct, not gut instinct, all of that is just ripe for O C D, you know. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 So, you know, whether someone comes to you in the therapy room or just someone listening, how do you start to like what are some go to skills, I guess, or tools that you would mm teach if someone just had no grounding in mindfulness and you just wanted to give them something to go away and work on what, what mm. would that be that's a great question i think um i would probably suggest trying doing a like a daily activity in a mindful way mm. um it's another sort of trojan horse actually so um instead of meditating and closing your eyes and focusing on the breath and then, you know, noticing when you've been distracted, if you pick something like washing the dishes or brushing your teeth, there are all of these sensory experiences that ground you in the here and now. So if you're washing dishes, 
you've got the smell of the soap maybe, or the, you're watching this, those tiny bubbles kind of like blow off of, of the, the sponge and, um, you're hearing the sounds of the water running or the, the sponge against the, the pan. And then all of a sudden you're trying to figure out, you know, whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. And then you're like, Oh, wow, I'm doing that thing again. <laughs> um, and then you come on back to the present and you're again, grounded. That's the thing. So like, whether it's the breath, whether it's all of your sensory experiences, that's just a proxy for the present moment. You're just trying to bring yourself back, which it's the only moment in which we're ever alive and we can ever actually live. So um, just sort of perpetually reorienting toward like, oh, well, what's happening right now? I'm getting deeply curious about this experience that we all have all the time of washing dishes um, and what that's actually like. And, and um so yeah, like doing that dance of like focusing on the present, focusing on the present, noticing non-judgmentally, right? This is another area where that non-judgment is so crucial is that we tend to, um, people with OCD, people generally be very critical of ourselves. And then it's like, oh, my mind wandered again. What's wrong with me? <laughs> it's like, it's not that it's like, or if that happens, you can be like, oh, look, I'm beating up on myself for, for, for wandering or, you know, just noticing non-judgmentally to the best of your ability. Like, oh, look, I wandered. Well done me. I caught it. Uh, all right, back we go. Um, so exercising that same muscle of noticing when you're churning, when you're thinking, uh, and then gently bringing it back over and over again. It's just, instead of if you're doing a basic mindfulness meditation and you're anchoring your attention in the breath, you're anch anchoring your attention in the the sensory experiences of of uh, washing a dish or brushing your teeth or you know anything else you might do on a daily basis. Good point. Good point. And then it's no extra time. Exactly. You know, like yeah, it's just you're already using that time. Yep. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Because obviously a big one in meditation, for example, well, I now need to find five to ten minutes to sit yeah. down. And yeah. some people feel may feel they don't have that. Some people yeah. may generally not have that. Um, yeah. most yeah. most people will do, but they they'll feel no, I'm too busy and I'm you know, and I've I've had that yeah, you know, before that reason. But totally. mindfulness you can fit in anywhere, anytime. Yeah. Within reason, I'm sure if you're operating heavy machinery, or, but then again, you should be mindful. I, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like I hopefully I, you are. <laughs> yeah, it's my my OCD comes in of like, mm, you know, <laughs> should, when people are driving, should they be noticing the steering wheel? <laughs> no, but you should be mindful on the road in front of you. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting to hear, hear your take on this. So, like, um, sometimes I feel there's something to being mindful of the feeling in and of itself. So, like, with anxiety, it can feel it's such a horrible feeling, right? Just to judge mm. it for a second. That's just yeah. awful, but <laughs> it's it's such a horrible feeling. It feels so overwhelming sometimes, and you feel well, I can feel numb and tingly and all this stuff. But when I'm in the worst of it, it feels like it's everywhere and it's it's mm. powerful and it's all consuming. And I think sometimes just leaning into that anxiety and feeling it, okay, well, where is it in my body? Oh, actually, it's mainly in my stomach, but my legs feel a bit tingly and weak as well. So it's mm. also there. And, you know, and then that kind of at least takes it from being everywhere and confines it back to a part of my body, which makes it feel smaller. Yeah. You know? Now, yeah. can I can I live with this feeling in my legs? Well, I think I can versus it's everywhere. No, I can't live with that. That feels too much. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good point. And also, I think it, to that end, the it's not, it's everywhere and it's forever. Mm -hmm. I, do you know what I mean? Like that really goes with hand in hand with that of like, I'm going to feel this way forever. And that, I think that's something really important about acceptance too, is like, we're not saying you have to accept this experience forever. We're saying it, can you accept it Amen. right this second and then right this second and just not know how it's going to go. But it does feel very overwhelming, whether it's like, oh, it's everywhere and it's this nebulous thing and I don't know how to deal with it and it's going to go on forever. That's yeah, well, of course you're going to then ruminate about it or ask for reassurance or try to, you know, fix it somehow. Um, that's really such a, a good point. Um, actually I, I like, this is where I like, uh, Jill Bolte Taylor. Have you ever heard of her? No, I don't think so. 
So she is a neuroanatomist um, in the United States. She actually had a stroke and she wrote a book called My Stroke of Insight, which details her experience as a neuroanatomist watching herself have a stroke from the inside out, which is pretty wild. I think I may have. Uh, she done a TED talk. Yes. I got yeah. a feeling I may have seen that. that she brings a brain out onto the stage, It's yeah. which is intense. Um <laughs> Oh, an actual brain. Uh, like an actual brain. Like, oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think. I she got permission. <laughs> <laughs> she yeah. just took it off someone. I'll, I'll be right back. I, yeah. I, yeah, don't worry. You can trust me. Um, but yeah, in her book, she talks about the, the fact that emotions is a chemical, or they set off a chemical reaction in your body that lasts for 90 seconds from start to finish. Hmm. They said this cascade of hormones and, and, um, you know, neurotransmitters and all of that, that that like takes 90 seconds to wash through you. And that anything beyond that is just continual thinking Mm. that's leading to that sort of ongoing, like another 90 seconds, another 90 seconds, another 90 seconds. And so I think sometimes seeing that like, yeah, this is just, this is a, this is a reaction that's happening in my body. And, um, I'm just going to, breathe in and make sp- a space. And now I, I know that it's like, well, my, my feelings last for a lot li- longer than 90 seconds. Yeah. Well, again, if you're continually thinking about the this thing and, yeah. Thing and yeah, yeah, then you're probably going to keep feeding, feeding that yeah. feeling like, fl- like a uh, gasoline to a, a flame. Yeah. Um, but same idea of like, can we look at this as like, it's an experience rather than um, it's, completely consuming it's that Stephen Hayes has a great quote that uh the forefather or the founding father of act really um that uh you are large enough to contain all of your experiences mm, and nice. that's the same kind of idea right if I can just look at this as like I am the self and then there's this thing that's inc- occurring inside of me and I have the capacity to hold that for as long as it needs to be here yeah I love that yeah it's definitely not easy to feel that well it's it's simple but it's not Mm -hmm. easy to feel those things but i think over time you can definitely learn to make space and be with it and allow it you know yeah and it will it will go Um, yeah 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 Mm. um yeah really good so uh before we change directions is there anything else you want to say on mindfulness Mm. I don't, I don't know. Let me think. I I think actually I'll, what I will say is this, if there's one benefit to having to live with this disorder and, and I honestly, like we were talking about before, I think that, you know, we do have not to speak so well of us, but we have Ferrari like minds. Um, uh, but no, if there's like a benefit to having to walk through this recovery process, which can be so daunting and grueling in moments, um, such a trudge is on the other side. I've found this has informed my whole life in terms of how I approach it. And it's made for such a richer, deeper, more meaningful experience that because I'm willing, I'm able to see all of these internal experiences happening that, that they don't get to rule my life and not that it's perfect, but, and certainly I get lost from, from time to time. Um, that it's having the ability to see like, oh, I'm like in something totally unrelated to OCD. I don't, you know, I don't want fear running my life. I don't want anger running my life. I don't want any of my feelings to make my choices for me. And I don't want any of my thoughts to have that power either without like having the capacity to see them and what they're, what's going on and, and to consider that. So, um, I don't know. I, I'm like I said, I'm a huge fan of Pem Children. I think um understanding that uncertainty is our birthright, which is I think like part of this acceptance of mm. of all experiences. Like I could go down a really deep rabbit hole with that stuff, but um learning how to make space for all of that, it's freedom and it opens up life in so many beautiful ways. And so mm. um yeah, mindfulness is a an amazing adjunct to ERP um and to to recovery from OCD, but it's also just an amazing way to to s- support your journey through life. 
yeah it's a life skill yeah mm, yeah yeah true nice yeah. um yeah i like it being our our birthright um <laughs> that yeah. and taxes uh, <laughs> although some people get out of those so um, <laughs> the only uh, thing we have is uncertainty some mostly yeah. taxes yeah. and death death yeah, yeah yeah maybe it's uncertainty and death not death and taxes is it? <laughs> like that do you so i just out of curiosity yeah. too um because you mentioned the meditation thing and i'm i'm like a expert procrastinator of meditation um because it's the easiest thing to push off throughout the day I, and sometimes i think making it really bite-sized can be helpful like i'm gonna do three minutes i did three minutes of meditation a day for a year and mm -hmm. That was, I was like, okay, that's how I built my foundation. But I'm curious, do you, do you have a practice? Is that something that's part of your journey? Uh, no. Well, yes and no. It was when I was really, really struggling like seven years ago, I, I was mm -hmm. meditating daily. Um, I was doing everything, basically, not everything, a lot to try and get my mind right. Um, yeah. And meditation was part of that. And I generally think it started to help me diffuse and see my thoughts as thoughts and mm -hmm. not get so hooked. Um would I do that again? I'd probably go more the act route in a deeper way. But I mean, I do meditate it's sporadically at the minute. I don't, I, I go through these phases where I'll do it daily for a month. Then I won't touch it for like three months mm -hmm. because something gets in the way or I avoid the boredom of it or, um, yeah. but yeah, something Eric Coopers, who was on my podcast years ago, um, he, his meditation teacher said, I think it was his meditation teacher said to him, um, the only thing you should do with meditation is each day just get to your cushion or whatever it is, wherever you mm. meditate, your bed, your sofa, whatever, just get to that. No time restrictions is if you sit down and the moment you sit down, you're like, no, don't want to do it, then get back up. Mm. But there was something about putting yourself in that miracle territory, you know, because as soon as you mm. sit down, you probably think, well, I'll at least do a minute, mm. you know, and if you're doing that daily, it's going to build. And I yeah. really like that of just lowering the bar and just sit down. Totally. I love that. I want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. I, that's what a great mindset to have around it. Yeah. But no, I, I, I love meditation. I, but equally, you know, I know it's not right for everyone. And I know when some people go down a rabbit hole with it, then there can be problems with it. You know, I've seen so many things where they were meditating profusely for however long and going to all these retreats. And then they had some kind of like, I don't want to say, but like mental health issue as a result of it, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, well, certainly that's I, common, but it can happen. Right. And I think if, if, like, if, if you have a, a, an obsessive mind, right? Like, no, exactly. that, and, and a compulsive mind, like you end up, yeah, you could very easily spin down a very deep rabbit hole in, in all yeah. of that quiet time for sure. Exactly. But if you're five minutes a day, I, 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 I don't predict any problems, but I'm no. Yeah meditation teacher um but yeah, yeah. I, I like it i think for some people i rarely i will do it with a client if i generally think they could benefit and sometimes it's really useful for them you know mm. um especially if they don't know where to start or how to do it but yeah it's not a common yeah. part of my practice it's fair enough yeah. Yeah. yeah um but i use apps as well so i use calm mm. but when yeah. i started i used headspace they've got really good guided yeah. tutorials um, really good basics like, exactly yeah i just like yeah. calm because of the the rain sound effect and the ding at the end of the meditation and what did my the friend sleep, call it the sleep stories no i did it no? once it did, it did knock me out pretty quickly no i don't have yeah. a problem since having a kid i have no problem sleeping i <laughs> i am passing out in seconds um but yeah my friend called that ding at the end of the meditation um the dopamine dopamine ding <laughs> I think he created that, which That's is so awesome. true. It's like it's so pleasing when I hear that. It's like, yes, I did it, you know. And... <laughs> um, That's awesome. So, yeah. so um yes. Twenty year old self, what would you tell her if you could pick up the phone? Mm. Gosh. I just wonder if, if what she would hear, you know. <laughs> like um I because it, it's like I can imagine saying like, oh, well, you know, like you got this or, you know, you're going to, and I don't, I don't know if she was like, I don't know about this person. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think 
maybe that it's okay to leave things unresolved. You know, like you're, I would, I would tell her, like, I see all of these ways in which you're trying to fix and control and manage um, the unknown and like wanting to make sure that you're going to be okay. And it's really, I, I think I would say it's really hard sometimes to, to be with the unknown, to, to be wait, wait that's life. Um, actually just to tweak it a little bit, the question, if it's okay, yeah. um, to riff, because I, I think I often think of what I would say if I went back and talked to my seven-year-old self or, you know, I'm sure my mom thinks about that all the time too, mm-hmm. of like, and just saying like, wow, it's, it's really scary to not know. Right. Yeah. And what's it like to feel scared? And can we, can we make space for the scared instead of trying to get rid of it? Because, yeah. and, and to have somebody really like, not reassure, but to hold your hand and just say like, I'm here with you in the not in the, in the discomfort and the unknown. Um, I don't know. That's, I think what I like, you know, some earlier iteration of myself, I think I would just say like, I'm here with you in it. And, um, and you've got that you, you can be with this and I'll, I'll, you know, we'll just hold it together. Yeah. 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 I like that. Um, that may have made a world of difference, you know? Yeah, we can't go yeah. back, unfortunately. And maybe no. you wouldn't want to. Maybe you no. love who you are now, and no, that is I a do. byproduct yeah. of everything you've gone through. You know, I wouldn't change the life that I have today for I don't think mm-hmm. anything. Actually, that's a, a really great point. But yeah, no, I think that's my hope is that we can give that to other people who find themselves struggling now. Is just like let's be with the uncertainty together instead of trying to fix and resolve something that. It's just going to lead you down all sorts of alleyways that that detract from you, you know, showing up to your life. Right, good point. Um, and you're in LA, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. the billboard stew. Yeah, billboard and one of those the traffic jammed highways. <laughs> uh, what, what, I have what? so much anxiety about this question. It's like, oh, it has to be the right answer, which of course it won't be. Um. I don't know, something, something to the effect of you, you can have any thought and feel any feeling in the service of living the life that you want to live. It's a wordy billboard, but you know, to your point, there's lots of traffic. So people are sitting there for a while. They'll have time to read it. Yeah. 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 Um, But yeah, something I think to that effect yeah. Um, love if pe- more people knew that like, oh, yeah. you can just have all of these experiences and still do life on your terms and then uh, you're going to be more contented with the experiences that you create in that process very good point very good point um and then lastly anything else you wish you could have said or shared today no i think i i, I would love i i'm just like I want to like sit down and pick your brain about all this stuff now. <laughs> um, but no, I, I don't, I think I yammered on quite enough. Thanks for, for having me and um, for always for your insightful questions and thoughts and all of it. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. And it's great to have you on. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. And thank you to our patrons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.